Welcome back to the charismatic voice. Today's video is going to be a little bit different from the norm. We recently launched a Kickstarter campaign to fund vocal research. And at the time of filming this video, we have raised over 215,000 for science. I am so thrilled and humbled by our community's response. Thank you for your support and thank you for your trust. I've been working hard to earn your trust for years. And shortly after this campaign launched, some parties started to question this study, this dream really. And I've seen my words twisted. This really hurts. If you know the details surrounding the Kickstarter, you know that we formed a nonprofit to receive all of the proceeds from it. And I legally cannot make a single penny from it. I am donating my time to run it and I am creating free videos and giving away voice lessons as rewards for it. Comments like this that spread misinformation not only deeply hurt me, they also erode our community and this dream. So I wanna set things straight in this video and hopefully answer some questions that might be floating around. The study that we're proposing to fund through Kickstarter will not cure cancer. I have never said that this study is going to cure cancer and we'll get into more on that later. Our study will be the most in-depth research study ever done on harsh vocals. I'm very proud of this and I'm very proud of the steps that we've taken to be able to achieve this. Additionally, data will be made publicly available with artist permission. Our goal is to understand how the upper laryngeal structures function. And we selected a group of people who use these structures to the extremes professionally, metal singers, and specifically singer screamers who can utter full sentences in multiple styles of growls or vocal distortions. The procedures that we'll be using to gather the data will build upon our current knowledge and understanding and offer a comprehensive exploration of metal singers' throats. Yes, we have looked down the throats of rock and metal singers before. These studies were how I was first introduced to what some of the anatomy behind these distortions might be. And they made me a lot more curious about what a cookie monster growl would look like. So far, these studies are using cameras with a bird's eye view. Those are cameras um, that can be flexible, go up through the nose, down the back, or even be a rigid scope. And it looks down here at the larynx below. That's how we first saw into Will's throat. Now, there is a limitation with this. When you're looking from a bird's eye view down, anything that is constricting above makes it difficult to see the stuff down here. So with Will, we saw a lot of incredible constriction, really, really high, very dynamic, and it obscured the view of the lower structures. Our study will gather data beyond the bird's eye view. And you can actually see these procedures if you go to the second video we made with Will Ramos, where he goes through DMRI. DMRI is very important to our study because it presents live video feed of sagittal view, and you can see all the structures working together at the same time. We also have multiple different angles in the DMRI. Additionally, we'll be gathering data from electrodes that are placed around the larynx to measure muscle activation. And we'll be running respiratory and kinematic tests with simultaneous laryngoscopy. So while these electrodes are in the neck, there's also a band around the chest and there's a camera looking down all at the same time. The testing procedures take three full days for artists. And I have to add that if at any point an artist doesn't feel comfortable or doesn't want to do a test, we absolutely will not make them do it. I always aim to support artists. The results will be the most in-depth data ever gathered on laryngeal functions during extreme vocalizations. Are we gonna cure cancer with this study? No. I have quoted peer-reviewed papers that documented cancer cell destruction with sound. And I've also shown some peer-reviewed papers that discussed music therapy as cancer treatment. But I've never said that this study is going to cure cancer. However, the applications of this study and how it paves the road for future advancements in music and singing therapy can improve the lives of millions, including, but not limited to, people suffering from cancer. And here's how. First, the most immediate application is to singer screamers. And there are a lot more of you than I would have ever guessed. Our study is not 
aiming to come up with a particular curriculum, but I do hope that people teaching this style will use data gathered from it. Next, there are tons of possible applications to other styles of singing and speech. We are studying general laryngeal function in a way that's never been done before. I'm particularly hopeful that researchers that are setting this crossover of upper and lower laryngeal function will be able to use our data in their study. Anytime you shift a structure in the vocal tract, the overall mechanism adjusts, and that can change the sound entirely. Singing is a very complex function, and it's based around things like breath pressure, flow as well, constriction and relaxation, and this ever-evolving resonance chamber. I fully expect that as we gain more knowledge about the supraglottic structures, our understanding of how everything functions together will evolve. And this doesn't just apply to singing, it applies to speech as well. Do you sing or do you speak? Then this study could impact you. One of the statistics that I find most useful to quote is that 47% of people in the US have experienced a voice disorder at some point in their lifetime. Our methods for treating voice disorders are continually improving. Understanding how these upper laryngeal structures can function is the first step to investigating how they can be involved in voice therapy. I foresee some of the greatest impact for people who have suffered from a neurological disorder or throat cancer, rendering them unable to use their two vocal folds. We do know from research that you can use the false vocal folds when the two vocal folds are somehow paralyzed or not able to be used. So I think it's essential for these people that we understand how false folds can be optimized. Beyond vocal application, this research aims to pave the way for music and singing related therapies to include upper laryngeal structures in future research and also to inspire the next wave of researchers. I think that there are some very persuasive reasons why these supraglottic structures should be included in conversations about future music therapy research. Let's take a look at the thyroid. The thyroid is located just below your voice box. The hormones produced by the thyroid gland regulate growth, energy levels, heart rate, digestion, mood, and more. The thyroid vibrates when you vocalize. There are also a ton of studies about how singing affects your mental health. In some cases, this is linked to your hormones. It just amazes me, honestly, how much we're discovering singing can impact your hormones. Mental health is also tied to neurological activity. And one of the most fascinating studies I've read involved brain imaging done in collaboration with NIH and an opera singer named Renee Fleming. Compared to speaking, more areas of the brain were active when she was singing. And the coolest part is that even more areas of the brain were active when she was just thinking about singing. I think that the supraglottic structures in particular should be studied for their ability to stimulate the brain because even more structures are being innervated than in clean singing. The primary nerve that branches into your larynx is the vagus nerve, and that nerve also controls many involuntary functions like digestion, heart rate, breathing, and immune system responses. We can voluntarily stimulate the vagus nerve through singing. By the way, that opera singer with the brain scan, Renee Fleming, has gone on to become a leading supporter of music therapy. She recently released a book earlier this year called Music and Mind, and this is an amalgamation of studies and writings from leaders in the field. I highly recommend it to all. In that book, you can read about how music therapy improves heart disease, alleviates pain, anxiety, and depression, improves mobility for people with disorders like Parkinson's disease and MS, and how it's used in pediatric cancer care settings, and much, much more. The more I read about music therapy, the more it seems limitless. But to get there, initial steps have to be made. This study is an initial step, and it follows in the footsteps of all the people that have paved the way to make it possible. Will this study cure cancer? No. However, I will post some references below to related studies along with a link to Renee Fleming's book and some more music therapy. Every study should be reviewed and if possible replicated, and it's always going to be possible to find holes. It's my goal to support and fund research that will allow upper laryngeal structures to be included in the conversation. I believe that extreme metal vocalists can change the world, and I believe that our community can have a positive impact on the world through supporting this research. Thank you to everyone who has already supported the campaign. 
I am so humbled and grateful to you all. Also, big shout out of thank you to our volunteer artists. Thank you guys so much for your trust. And also thank you to our team of researchers. Let's continue to spread gratitude as a community. I invite you to also share some research references below. And please call out to a doctor or a researcher who has made your life better. I want to hear that story about their positive impact. So tag them or uh, just mention them by name in the comments and tell us about how they positively impacted your life. May we all continue to fall more in love with music every day.